Welcome, everyone. I'd like to just very briefly introduce Chris Hartnady. Chris is a preeminent geologist. Um, he's, he's very much a Cape Townian. Um, he studied at UCT. He started off, um, and, I'm, and I'm summarizing here, on the Precambrian Research Unit. Um, unit. And, and looking at, at our old rocks in Southern Africa. He, he also has a very close association with Hermanus. Um, Chris and his wife Rowena, and in particular the company Invoto, have been key um, to unlocking and development, developing the big aquifers that sit below uh, um, gorgeous Table Mountain sandstones, the Table Mountain group behind Hermanus. And as I think people who live in Hermanus will know, about 30% of our, our water supply actually comes from the aquifer at the base of, of these mountains. Um, so, so he has um, a direct interest in, in Hermanus too, and, and they've really done some world-class work in that respect. Chris has diverse interests. Um, he, he started looking at old Archean rocks and the development of the continents. He's also been involved in, um, in the earthquake studies, seismic studies in, in and around the Cape. He has great knowledge of the Tulbach and Milneton earthquakes and how they came about. More recently, he's ventured or, or sort of uh, moved into plate tectonics, and he'll talk a bit about that today, how the different plates work and how that drives volcanism, which is, in a sense, what he's talking about. And, and so we, we, we look forward to hearing Chris this morning talk about a trip that he had in, what was it, 2019 to Mount Etna and, and the volcanoes of southern Italy. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Chris and say thanks to him for making time to give this presentation this morning. Thanks, Chris. I'm going to be talking about the volcanoes on the Nubia Eurasia plate boundary in and around Sicily. Um, uh, the subtitle of my talk is From Stromboli to Etna. And this was a trip we did in, in May 2019. Uh, just the background to this trip. Um, I'd been interested in the, the Nubia Eurasia plate boundary uh, for some time, mainly arising out of work that I'd been doing uh, on the East African rift system. Um, but also going back to in the early 90s. In the early 90s, I got involved with NASA uh, in their space geodesy program, and they began to do work on the radio telescopes um, on the African continent. Well, that's hard to be a sook, but there is a radio telescope on, on Sicily. Uh, it's at a place called Noto. And so that, that was the beginning of my interest there. Um, and and the, the mapping the, the motions of the plates uh, using conventional means, magnetic anomalies in the ocean basin, or in uh, using GPS, um, the uh, interferometric synthetic aperture radar methods from space satellites, and also the, the radio telescope methods. So uh, that was my interest. And my interest really went from South Africa up around the East African rift system, and then onto the Eurasia Nubia plate boundary. Uh, so here, and then the particular spur for the 2019 trip was a, a, a rather large eruption of Etna on Christmas Eve. And so what you see is, is a view from uh, an aircraft taken flying over Palermo. That's the north coast of Sicily that you see looking towards the Aeolian Islands out in the east. Um, and there you see the, uh, the plume coming out uh, shortly after Etna had exploded on Christmas Eve 2018. That then spurred myself and Steve Richardson, who's attending this talk, to sign up for a nine-day tour involving a trip to uh, Stromboli, uh, some of the other islands uh, near Stromboli, and uh, Etna. So that's the background. So just to put the, the geography here, I'll try and uh, wave my cursor around a bit if I can uh, get it visible. 
So Etna is on the east side of Sicily, uh, looking into the Ionian Sea. Stromboli is on the south uh, edge of the Tyrrhenian Sea. And what you see is, is the map of the, the Eurasian plate boundary, or at least one version of that boundary. That's the gray barbed line that runs around, uh, curves around in the Ionian Sea and then runs through Sicily towards uh, the Maghrebian uh, orogenic belt in North Africa. Um, in this area, uh, the two plates, that is the Eurasian plate to the north and the Nubian, that's a, a part of the African plate you will see, uh, that they converge at about nine millimeters a year, which is a pretty slow motion um, uh, in roughly a northwest to southeast direction. That is Africa relative to Eurasia is moving northwestwards, sorry. So, and then the, 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 this next dimension looking down, what you see in the upper right hand corner is the Eurasian plate on the left, Sicily, and the, the oceanic crust of the Eastern Mediterranean being subducted below Sicily, uh, with what is described as the slab window over here beneath Etna. Now things are a little bit more complicated than that rather two-dimensional picture. And uh, uh, again, I come back to something I mentioned in the beginning, right up in the north there, you see um, a, a black triangle uh, marked NOT1. That is a GPS site now. There is the radio telescope, which is also a, a space geodetic um, uh, beacon or benchmark, if you like. But uh, there's been a fairly long-lived uh, GPS site um, on Sicily, and my colleague Richard Wanakot and I, and Richard, of course, is the father of the Trignet system in South Africa. So we've been looking at using GPS to determine the rigidity of the Nubia plate. A plate is rigid if it is the, uh, what we call the longitudinal strain rate is less than one or somewhere between one and three nanostrains a year. And uh, what you see in this map is a whole number of baselines between important uh, GPS sites, uh, Sutherland, a Lusaka site called ZAM, uh, uh, and so on, uh, and then also NOTO. And what you see is that everywhere, uh, the, the longitudinal strain is less than one nanostrain a year. Just to, to give you an idea of what that means, one nanostrain per year is a deformation of one millimeter over a thousand kilometers. So we are looking at, uh, at the moment, we've got very sensitive techniques to measure the real-time motion of, of plates and their internal deformation. So that, that's my interest in go, extending from the East African rift system where they are rather, and along the Red Sea, the Nubian Arabian plate boundary around into the rather more complex Eurasian boundary, which you see along the north edge of that map. So um, coming to Noto and, and southern Sicily, the, the important point I want to make on this slide uh, is that that area of Sicily, we, we call it the Hiblian Plateau. Uh, so that's the area east of the, the city of Syracuse, we have the map there. Uh, and Noto is down below, uh, in, in, on the uh, further south, it's southwest of um, Syracuse, uh, and that's a, a, a sort of a little uh, close-up of the radio telescope. Uh, I visited uh, Sicily with my wife in, in May 2017 to look, uh, to make a sort of pilgrimage to Noto. We didn't get to the radio telescope, but we did get to the cathedral uh, and its fairly magnificent internal art. But uh, as I say, the important thing about the Hiblian Plateau is that geologically, it is a piece of Africa. Uh, so again, going back to reconstructing a, a, a sort of sequence of maps as to how Sicily developed from Pangaea, you see a sequence of fairly recently published maps over here, the upper uh, left-hand one, 240 million years ago, and here you see Africa in yellowish colors, the Iberian Peninsula in orange and Europe in, uh, in greens. 
Uh, and then this area south of Europe is an extension of Africa, which is now called Greater Adria. So it is really a part of the African continent that then sometime around uh, before 170 million years ago, that's the diagram in the uh, lower left, rifted away from the main African continent in part, but then that rifting ceased. Um, uh, when one comes um, further forward in time, uh, what you see in the lower right diagram is this greater Adria continent starting to collide with parts of Eastern Europe and the, the Balkan region. Uh, so now the Hiblian Plateau is marked HP, it's in that sort of darker uh, yellow area. The area of Northern Sicily, however, is part of what we call the uh, Peloritani Calabria terrain or Pica on this map. And Pica was essentially part of Southern Europe uh, in the beginning. So coming forward in time again, about 30 million years ago, this was the position. The, uh, the, the African Eurasian plate boundary had started to become indented by uh, Adria driving in or Ata Adria, greater Adria driving in towards the Alps. The, the curvature of the Western Alps is now starting to show up. Uh, the Peloterrani Calabria terrain is still attached to Southern France, but then about 50 or sometime before 15 million years ago, that both Sardinia and Corsica and the Pica terrain started to rift away from Southern France to open the Gulf of Lyon. So that's the position 15 million years ago. And then the present time, uh, uh, the Pica terrain has collided with the Hiblian Plateau, uh, all along the way, it's collected these other fragments of that darker yellow region, piled them up into a, a ra rather complex orogenic zone between the, uh, the collided exotic terrain and the uh, essentially the foreland of the African continent in the Hiblian Plateau. So that's what we've got there. But there's also something rather more interesting uh, about that area in that the, uh, and this is a, a series of maps describing from about 6 million years ago, that's in the upper right, through 5.2 million years, 4 million years, and present day, the collision of that, uh, the Pika terrain, uh, which is the, the shaded area in a sort of purplish tone, uh, and the, uh, uh, the, the, the margin of Sicily and southern Italy, uh, or Calabria. Uh, now, the key thing about this is that um, this island arc that's coming in with the volcanoes of Stromboli uh, and uh, the other volcanoes of the Aeolian Islands, which are north of the Pica terrain, those are conventional island arc type um, volcanic units. Uh, Etna, on the other hand, has developed along and above uh, this rather interesting structure, which uh, the formal name for it is a subduction transform edge propagator fault, or so-called step fault. And essentially, it's a, a big tear structure. If you imagine tearing a piece of paper, uh, essentially the oceanic lithosphere of the uh, eastern Mediterranean, which is shown in the, the lower left there, is being torn away from the continental crust of Africa along that structure. Uh, so that's the, that's the picture, and Etna, if I just go back to that slide, sorry, Etna is, uh, is directly above a kind of slab window, a gap in the lithosphere where that tear is propagating through the northern part of the island. Um, and that's what makes it quite interesting. And, and studying the local deformations using GPS on Sicily has been an interest of mine. Uh, uh, in recent years. So um, going on to the next slide then, this is the picture then of, um, it's, a, it's a more recent map of Etna, uh, which is up over here, that's the summit uh, regions of Etna over here, this is the coastline of Sicily. And the, the key thing about this, apart from the convergence between Eurasia in the northern side and uh, uh, Africa or Nubia on the southern side 
is the fact that Etna itself is deforming in quite a complicated way and, and in a way quite alarmingly. Um, one of the big features of Etna is that the whole of its eastern side is bounded by faults in the north. You can see over there is something called the Pernacana Fault. And then down in the south, there's something running offshore is something called the Catania Canyon. And there's a set of forts which come in uh, past the suburb called Masca Lucia. Uh, those are, are the southern forts of a big, um, essentially a flank collapse of Etna. Uh, so you can, you can see that, that Etna has not only got earthquake hazards because of its plate boundary and the, the different subduction and transform forts that surround it. Uh, there's the volcanic hazard of Etna itself, but then there's also with the earthquakes and with the potential flank collapse of Etna on its eastern side, is a, is a big tsunami hazard as well. So, um, so those are the, the, the background of my interest or the geological interest in this area. So the, the key thing now, this is going on to the travel out now. Um, our trip really, we flew in, uh, um, Steve Richardson and his wife, Marion Ellis had, had arrived, I think the day before and they had, had gone to, uh, northwards to Taormina for a while to be tourists there. Uh, uh, Ruina and I arrived in on the 2nd of May, and then we went to a, a place called Pozzillo. I'll go back to that previous slide that's marked on the coast there um, in, uh, in yellow. Um, that's a, a small town or village um, in which... Uh, on the eastern side of Etna, so that's the, that's the view that we had on the morning of May the 3rd, the dawn on Etna from the bedroom of the cottage that we then were staying in. It actually belongs to a cousin of Marion's uh, called Simona. Uh, so Simona's cottage was our base for the first day or two. Um, and uh, we had, Druin and I had this magnificent view of Etna in the morning, uh, sun rising on it and then a couple of telescopic views of Etna, um, further, uh, uh, further up one on the upper right. But the key thing over here is what you see that I'm pointing at now is what is called the new southeast crater of Etna. All of this is the Etna summit area. That's the, uh, the northeast or north crater of Etna with the fumaroles and the steam rising. You can also see some fumarole activity here. You will also notice that there's a little bit of a, a, a white trace over there. That is the um, a, a fumarole uh, area, which actually feeds uh, and was the site of the roof that fed the, the lava flows that followed the December 2018 eruption. So you can see there are, are kind of a grooved area coming down below that little white area. That is the 2018, one of the 2018 lava flows um, in that area. Another one you can see coming down over here, these sort of uh, channel structures are the lavas that followed the big explosion in December uh, 2018. So we, we were based at Pozzillo in on May the 4th, which was just prior to the start of our, our field excursion with the volcano discovery team. Uh, we visited uh, a friend of Simona's at the National Institute for Geophysics and Volcanology. They have their headquarters in a rather grand building. That's uh, you can see that in the uh, that's their entrance uh, sign uh, in a in this rather big mansion in uh, in Catania, and we there we were received by uh, Dr. Ornella Cochina who's a, a volcano seismologist. So you see in the lower left, Steve and I, um, in uh, one of the areas of INGV with the map, the geological map of Etna behind us. And here you see us in the sort of a, a kind of museum area where Ornella is showing us some of the exhibits that they have as part of their educational materials in, in, in part of the INGV. We were also taken to uh, the 
operations room or the sala operativa, which is on one of the, or the uppermost floor, just below the, the, uh, the roof area of INGV. And this is where they have 24 hour monitoring. As I say, because Catania is in from a volcanic and an earthquake and a tsunami point of view in a rather hazardous state, uh, uh, the government of Italy has invested quite a lot of money into continuous monitoring of earthquake activity, the volcanoes, so they have webcams uh, trained um, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year on uh, both Etna and Stromboli. Uh, and then all of this is continuously monitored by shifts of scientists who come in two, two at a time to, uh, to make sure that, that if anything happens, uh, they know about it immediately. So we were shown over that. Uh, and then uh, our real trip with the Volcano Discovery Group began on the evening of May the 4th. We met our guide at the hotel and he then took us down through Catania. We took a walk through the town to the, the Norman Castle, uh, which was affected by the 1669 eruption. So if you look at that upper, upper right hand map, uh, the red areas are there show the 1669 flows coming south from a fairly low elevation on the south flank of Etna. Um, and at this time, at that time, 1669, the, this castle, the Castello Ursino, was right on the coastline. Uh, and, and it got completely surrounded by uh, the, the lava flow and uh, about um, a few meters, you can see the, the, uh, the channel over here. This is the western side on the lower left. They've excavated down to the original foundation and the original level that the castle was uh, originally built at. Everything else, of course, is built at a much higher level. Uh, the road level here is, of course, the surface of the 1669 flow. Uh, on the north side of the castle, they are still busy with the excavations. The idea is to, and it's part of an archaeological um, investigation of the castle site uh, in that area. So that was the, uh, that was our, our meeting uh, with our, the two other members of our party who, who I'll introduce later and our guide. So our guide, uh, over here uh, on, in the right-hand image with the blue jersey is Marco Fule. Uh, now Marco is by profession not a geologist, he's actually an astrophysicist uh, who works uh, for the European Space Agency on the Rosetta mission to comets. And he's actually a specialist in, in remote imaging of comets uh, in space. But his big hobby is volcano photography. And he's built up quite a reputation as a publisher, or he's published his books on uh, particularly Stromboli and Etna have uh, been published. And so uh, he was our guide and, uh, and, and an excellent one at that. So on the, on the lower left here, uh, you see um, Marco and, and uh, one of our other tea, uh, party members, uh, Roz Moran from Australia, uh, are, are in a cavern below the restaurant. This, what you can see with the lights on in the background is actually a flowing stream. Now with the 1669 flows, once the flows had hit the ocean and then continued to flow in lava tubes out to sea, the lava tubes later on became the main ways in which water gets from Mount Etna down to the ocean. So there are no surface streams in Catania. There are only these lava tubes uh, below the lava, uh, the rough lava terrain. So, and, and this restaurant has a little staircase going down to the, uh, the tunnel. So that, that's just a, an interesting feature of that, um, uh, our first day. The next day was uh, heading from the hotel very early in the morning to a port called Malazzo. It's a ferry port uh, on the north coast of Sicily. And it, uh, it lies immediately south of the Aeolian Islands. 
Uh, the three islands that we actually visited were Volcano, uh, Lipari, uh, which are closer to Malazzo, and then, of course, up in the eastern side, the northeastern side, Stromboli, marked with the S there. Uh, these other two islands off to the west are uh, Alicudi and Filicudi, uh, and then the island to the north of Lipari is Salinas, and you'll see a bit of that later on. So that was our departure. Um, as it happened, uh, our wives, Rowena and Marion, were leaving on the same ferry because Simona, uh, Marion's cousin, had another house on Salinas, uh, uh, Salina over there. And so they were on their way to Salina while we were on our way to uh, Volcano. So that afternoon uh, was the afternoon dedicated to climbing uh, Volcano. So this is the, the island of Volcano. Uh, the port, you can see now, you can just see the harbor wall uh, just along at the edge of um, the bay. Uh, this is the peninsula called Vul Vulcanello. And then uh, uh, on the northern side of the isthmus between Vulcanello and the main island, uh, that was where our hotel was. Uh, there's a black sand beach, which you will see later on. And there's a, an area over here on the northern side of uh, Volcanello where there's something called the Valley of Monsters uh, with very unusual um, uh, geological shapes, uh, lava uh, blocks that look like various um, bears and, and other kinds of animals. So that, this is just a view. Again, the Lipari is the island immediately to the north. And then the double peaked island is Salina uh, over there. Uh, and again, this is the uh, uh, part of uh, the volcanic topography of um, Volcanello. We were climbing up the cone of the active crater. And you'll see on the upper uh, right the, uh, some of the big lava bombs. Um, now there's a style of eruption called Volcanian, which uh, in which very large lava bombs are ejected with great explosive force. So, and that's uh, Volcanian style of eruption comes from the island of Volcano. Uh, and, and these uh, were initially molten blocks, which were propelled no doubt thousands of meters into the air and then fell back uh, around the, the volcano. So um, uh, that's, uh, that's the view. Uh, what you also have, of course, are the uh, solfatara, the, uh, the fumaroles and the sulfur exhalations. Uh, this is on the edge. It's on the uh, sort of eastern or northeastern side of the, the crater. And, and here's our party tiptoeing across the um, and trying to stay uh, out of uh, breathing in too much sulfur dioxide. Um, uh, the, the actual crater pit is shown in that view in the upper right. Again, this is looking down across that, uh, that Solfatara area, the yellow area on the, uh, the crater edge over there with the main pit down over here below. That whole structure was created with the big eruption in 1889. Uh, the, the island has been dormant since. And again, you see from this view, taken higher up on the mountain, uh, the island of Lipari and then Salina in the background. Um, the other view out across towards the east now is the view between uh, out to Stromboli. So that on the horizon there is Stromboli and the island between uh, Lipari and Stromboli is Panaria. That's the small island between uh, 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 between the two other volcanic massifs that you see there. Um, we were supposed to have left for Stromboli uh, on May the 6th. That's the Monday. Uh, but we couldn't uh, because all the ferries had been shut down by extremely bad weather. Uh, in fact, when we were, uh, uh, w when I took this photograph, it was quite difficult to stand up because the wind was so high at the time on that ridge. Um, and then the rain came in overnight, the ferries got shut down. And so 
Um, as my title says, it was a stormy day and we had an extended uh, stay because, well, most of the morning we had to spend in the hotel. The weather was too furiously bad. Uh, but we did manage to drive around the island in the afternoon. And so the slide on the upper uh, right is taken uh, mainly from the south side of Volcano, looking up at the, at the crater that we climbed the previous day. So, uh, and this is another view. This is the Black Sand Beach, just uh, on the edge of our, our hotel, essentially with the, uh, the Volcano, Volcanello Peninsula in the background there, uh, between uh, Lipari and, and, the, and the bay. And then up in the upper right here are these, there's the, there, there's one of the monsters of the, uh, the, the Valley of the Monsters that, that I spoke about earlier. Uh, so it, it wasn't sure that the ferries would be operative the next day because the weather was still fairly bad. But what we did was we made sure we left our hotel very early in the morning. And uh, we were the first on the, uh, the uh, Volcano Harbor uh, to make sure that if the ferries were running, we would be first in the queue, which we were. Uh, and so um, what you see is the harbor of Volcano up on the left-hand side of the slopes of the volcano itself. And then in the upper right, I put in a, a painting which was made of the 1889 explosion. In fact, there was a Scotsman whose name I've forgotten who lived on the island at the time and there were some artists there and they recorded uh, the scene of the volcanian eruption uh, in that year. So we, we then moved to, to um, Stromboli, and this is a map of the, uh, the, the area. Um, we stayed in a hotel on the eastern side of the main village, um, which is on the northeast side of the island. And we had two days there, essentially. Um, the first day, the, the, uh, the path that we followed is in white. Um, we were essentially doing a, a sort of reconnaissance hike around the northern side of the volcano towards the ridge. Uh, and then uh, the plan was after having done that afternoon hike, we would have dinner at, this, uh, uh, at a pizza restaurant called the Osservatorio down there. And, and that would give us a good view up the ridge that we were going to climb in the next afternoon. We had an off morning because the, uh, the ridge climb uh, would only start at about 4 p.m. on the 8th of May. Uh, and you'll see why the, re uh, the reason for that. So our first day was walking from the hotel through the village past the cathedral, San Vincenzo, uh, and then up. Uh, towards the uh, the volcano, up the path. Uh, the main uh, tourist route up the volcano goes up this ridge on the northeastern side, directly from the town. And then there's a zigzag area up here, uh, which joins the path that we followed around about there, uh, high up on the, the north ridge. So, uh, 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 so uh, we, on the next day, we ascended on the North Ridge and met a lot of the tourists. We fortunately, again, were up there early before most of the tourists came up from the, the village to settle down to look at the eruptive activity uh, on the summit crater uh, around about here. There afterwards, after we'd seen that, we descended at night down the scree slope over here and then rejoined the tourist path back down to uh, the village. So just to, to give you an idea, that's our hotel looking up towards the mountain on the upper right. This is the view up towards the main tourist climb up uh, to the summit of Stromboli. And then we, we took the contour path looking down on the, uh, the town, uh, the harbor there uh, and, the, and the harbor wall. And, and out here, there's a, an island with a, a, a lighthouse on it. That's uh, the island of Strombolicio. Uh, on the upper right, you see the, uh, the tower of the, the San Vincenzo uh, Cathedral. Um, this is 
looking up towards the summit of Stromboli from the lower part of the North Ridge. Sorry, I, I and what, what you see there is the continuous fumarole activity from the summit region. It was quite a, a strong easterly wind blowing that day. And then every now and then you get these Strombolian explosions, these, these explosions and the ejection of ash into the, um, into the atmosphere. And that's what you see, the brown cloud over there. Uh, on, the, on that slope below the summit area, there is what is called the, the fire stream or the Sierra del Fioco. So that's the uh, big uh, volcanic scree slope that runs down to the sea. Uh, and is the path of pyroclastic flows or lava flows sometimes down into the ocean from that summit. Um, so we, uh, this again is our, um, our, our view from the restaurant, uh, looking up the North Ridge towards the Stromboli summit. And this introduces our party. Uh, the, um, we, the other couple uh, on the trip with Steve and myself were Vince Morand, he's, he was a lecturer at La Trobe University in Melbourne, Australia, and, and his wife, Roz, who's a, who's a biologist, environmentalist. So they were, that, that constituted our party, five of us with our guide, Marco Fule, in the, uh, on the, on the right-hand side of the image. And this is a view of one of these Strombolian explosions, the dark ash going out of the summit from that site. Um, our dinner went on into the evening and so we then strolled back to the hotel along a coastal path from the observatorio. Um, and then the next day, as I say, the, um, the, the meeting place was set for 4 p.m. We had a morning off just to be tourists in the town, uh, but we then met our guide in the late afternoon our guide is Renzo. You can't, you can't go above a certain level on Etna without a, an accredited guide who is your, not only your guide, but also the safety officer for your tour and has got all the equipment that you require, the helmets and so on, for when you are in proximity to the, the crater. So again, this is from our, our meeting place. Um, and uh, Ruck, uh, the guide Renzo had his dog Ruxa along, you'll see Ruxa uh, later on. So the, the point here is that our climb, in contrast to the main uh, tourist route up, is one in which we, it, it's a bit of a, a scramble at times. Um, so there's a little bit of easy scrambling up the ridge, but uh, essentially a, a, a steepish climb up the ridge where you can see the crater and the, uh, the fire stream slope at all times. And that, and that makes it uh, very interesting. You also see signs of uh, big paroxysmal explosive activity. And here's a, a typically pear-shaped lava bomb from a, obviously a very big explosion from that crater. Um, you, wanna, you wouldn't want, want to be around when uh, lava bombs of that size were landing on the ridge. Um, and then uh, up in the uh, upper right, you can see higher up on the slope, the view across towards the, uh, the steaming crater area. So the main point of, of, of starting that trip early about 4 p.m. is to arrive on the summit at about sunset, where one gets a good um, view at, as dusk approaches of the... Um, of the volcano. And, and by that time, of course, we got there quite early, fortunately ahead of most of the, the tourist parties. Um, and so this is where you can see scores of tourists now settling down uh, to look at the, at the view. On the horizon, the southwestern horizon over there, you can see Salina and the, uh, the two other islands further off to the west, Alicudi and Filicudi. Um, so this is what we were wanting to look down on. This is the, um, our view across the main crater area. Uh, in the upper right, you can see uh, Vince and Roz settling down over there. Uh, here's uh, the dog Ruxa who came on here. 
and and I might just point out these uh, these structures over here are part of the monitoring equipment up on the top there. Uh, that uh, one of those pieces of equipment is a webcam which is aimed down at the craters so that they can be monitored visually at all times, and that that will have some significance later. So that's what we were doing. We'd come up there just at dusk as the sun was setting to look at the, um, at the activity as night fell. And here you can begin to see the glow of these two little eye-like uh, craters uh, uh, on the, uh, in the summit region, the active summit region. Um, and uh, what I'm now going to do is show a picture take or a, a, a video taken in 2018 by our guide Marco Fuller uh, at one of his previous visits to the, uh, the area. So if I just get this going, I won't show the whole thing. Uh, um, just make sure that the sound is, is on. Um, so this was taken in, in October 2018 by, by Marco when, when he was up with another party. Uh, and you can find it on the web if you're interested in looking at the whole thing yourself. So there, there are those two little glowing eyes uh, that we saw in my previous photograph. Uh, but you will see other kinds of activity. So, so that's the, um, that's the, the a blast, the Strombolian blast of ash uh, uh, out of the, uh, and, and lava bombs out of the crater. And then in the background, you will see something else. Oh. This is a, a very energetic, um, it, it's something that we, we call the, the Bunsen burner. Uh, so that, 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 as I say, we call that the Bunsen burner. Um, I'll, 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 I, there's a rather spectacular eruption from the crater in a while. Uh, so th this is what, from about 6 p.m. when it started to get dark, we watched until about 9 p.m. all of this kind of activity, the, uh, the glowing... Uh, uh, craters in the foreground and then the Strombolian blasts with occasionally these very furious and very energetic gas exhalations uh, from the, the other vent uh, in the uh, closer towards the, the east. We we'll, we'll have one more look at the... Uh, uh, let's see if we can get the Bunsen burner again. <clears throat> there we go. Oh. So I'm, I'm going to um, carry on now uh, uh, to the, uh, so that, that was our evening on Stromboli and, and it was a very spectacular evening indeed. Um, that was just a, 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 a short excerpt from Marco's um, video. The next day we, we embarked on the ferry heading back uh, west towards Lipari. Uh, there's a Stromboli giving a, a final little blast just as we were about to board the ferry in the upper right. So Lippery, our, our tour there was a rather brief one. It was just an afternoon. It started off with lunch uh, at, a, a, at a very nice restaurant uh, called Il Gallione in the main town on Lippery. We drove uh, anti-clockwise or counterclockwise around the island, stopping at a, a big pumice quarry, which is no longer active. Uh, uh, some outcrops of volcanic glass or obsidian, and then just took uh, a scenic view around the island 
then finally stopping uh, on a, a view site towards Volcano and Sicily, the mainland of Sicily um, in the south. So I'll go quickly through the, the slides. This is, is a picture taken of the, uh, the pumice quarry, which as I say is no longer active. And so all of the industrial complex over here is now um, uh, abandoned essentially. Uh, the upper right hand picture is a picture of the actual obsidian outcrop that we, um, we looked at, just a, a closer view of it. Uh, a view out driving along the north coast to the island of Salina. Um, I, I mentioned up at the top there that that was the, uh, if anyone has seen the movie Il Postino, which is, is a pretty good movie, uh, it was set on the island, or part of it was set on the island of Salina. Um, and then this is the view southwards now, uh, the, uh, uh, the bay uh, containing the hotel that we stayed at in Vo of Volcano, uh, the, the dormant crater of Volcano itself uh, over there, and the rest of the island behind. And then the, the fort, these are actually a forted cliff zone along the southwestern side of Lipari, within the background, uh, Mount Etna, just on the horizon uh, with mainland Sicily uh, in, in the background there. So we, uh, from there, we, we boarded the ferry again, went back to Milazzo, and then essentially it was already dusk. We, we drove through to our site in, uh, uh, on the, the massif of Etna. Uh, and uh, we stayed at a hotel just west of the main cable car station uh, at the base of the South Ridge. Uh, so there's a, you can't quite see it very well here, but there's a cable car route going up. The upper station is somewhere around here near Montagnola. Uh, and and the, uh, you'll see the, the route after that from the upper cable station is a road that goes up to the Philosopher's Tower, which is the guide base at the base of the main summits of Etna. Uh, over on this side, you have uh, the Val del Bove, that's the Valley of the Cows, and this is the Schiena del Asino, which means the donkey's back. So whereas we have a lion's head uh, in Cape Town, on Etna they have a donkey's back, which is the ridge um, uh, below uh, the southern summit uh, of Montagnola. Again, on Etna, you, you're required to have a, an accredited guide with you. So uh, we, this was Rosario who met us uh, at the parking lot uh, of the cable station. And this is a view through a rather dirty glass on the cable car looking back down towards the lower cable station as we were going up. Um, the, you are met at the upper cable station by buses if you want to go further on uh, up to the Philosopher's Tower and beyond. Uh, yeah, they, they have these four wheel drive buses which then take you up the road. Uh, you can see the road winding up. The Philosopher's Tower is up on the ridge uh, uh, between the main summit craters. This is the new Southeast Crater and the, uh, what is called the Crater Barbagallo, uh, which is on the left of that photograph. So uh, this is a view taken from uh, the Crater Barbagallo. And again, I just point out that little white spot over there is the, uh, the fissure that was still steaming, uh, which was at the head of the lava flows from the 2018 eruption. So the 2018 eruption was a big explosion from the, the new Southeast crater, but also the eruption of lava from a fissure on its, uh, on its flank. Uh, this is looking down at the guide base. The upper right shows the guide base from the, the crater Barbagallo. Uh, and again, that's the fissure area on the, the, uh, the slope of the New Southeast Crater. Now, um, unfortunately, my knees had been somewhat damaged by the, uh, the night descent from Stromboli. So this is the highest I made it. Steve Richardson made it to the top, uh, but I didn't. I hung around on the Crater Barbagallo. And so you won't see any higher shots from me 
but maybe Steve can give a shot, uh, give us a talk at some stage on the the real summit area of of Etna. Uh, so I, I mooned around or mooched around on my own on the Babagala, which and the Babagala craters were formed in 2002-2003 with a rather, rather major flank eruption uh, from Etna, which then flowed pretty close down towards the uh, uh, the outer parts of Catania. That's Catania, Mont Montagnola and Catania in the background um, on the left hand side there. This is looking up to the new southeast crater uh, on the right hand side. Um, we explored the rest of the day after the, the, the summit party had come down and rejoined me. We hiked down from the Babagallo, looking at the various fissures and, and lava channels that are exposed from the 2002-2003 flows. And then, of course, we headed back down the cable station. So the final day uh, on Etna was then the, uh, the day in which um, Steve and, and the, the two guides went up over, back up the cable car over Montagnola and down into the Valley of Cars. But um, me and the two Australians, we took this path coming from the, our hotel down the road and then up uh, a, a hiking path or donkey track really to the, the donkey's back. That's the ridge which goes up along the southern side of the valley of the cars up towards Montagnolo, which is the summit um, uh, close to where the upper cable station is. So um, again, just a couple of views. The, the craters near the uh, lower cable station are called the Silvestri craters. This is looking back from our path towards that area. So it's looking westwards, then looking eastwards out um, into the Ionian Sea is what we are doing now. And then this, this, the, the lava slopes in this area were created by a fairly major flank eruption in the, uh, the late 18th century, the 1792 to 93 flows. And again, what you see in the upper uh, right hand corner over here is the uh, one of these lava tubes. Uh, so you can see it's been broken, the hollow lava tube with the, uh, the sort of ropey lava exterior uh, on the outside there. Uh, here we, we are arriving on the, uh, the donkey's back, the ridge that runs up to Montagnola, which is the peak on the uh, left hand side, and then the new, new southeast crater uh, and its fissures uh, up at the top there. And then the darker flows over here that you can see on the right hand side are the 2018, the most recent flows uh, from the big fissures. So there's, there's generally the, this, this flank of Etna is actually a, a fairly major fault zone. And there have been numerous earlier flows of lava from the fissures along that uh, summit. So, um, so that's what you see as you look down into the Val del Bove. This is just panning around now. Again, the 2018 flows are quite visible with the older, I think these are 1950s, and there's a 1992 flow also down into the Val del Bove. Um, um, uh, this is a view out in a northeasterly direction. The, the town of Taumina is up in the haze there and uh, essentially a final view out in that northeasterly direction. So this is the whole side of Etna that we know from the GPS monitoring of the region is slowly but very slowly sliding down uh, into the Ionian Sea. Uh, and as I say, that's um, one of the, uh, the big hazards, not only the volcanic hazard, it's the flank collapse, the tsunamis, and the earthquakes. Um, so that essentially brings us to the end of that trip. We, we went back to the hotel. We then spent the next day moving back down to, um, to sorry about that. Uh, so we, we, we went back to um, Catania, but then I, I, this was an aftermath. So we were on, on Stromboli 
on July the, uh, sorry, uh, May the 8th, 2019. At about 2 p.m. on the afternoon of July the 3rd, and very fortunately not on the evening of July the 3rd, and even more fortunately not on the evening of May the 8th, uh, Stromboli uh, went into what they call a, a paroxysm, uh, a, a, a large eruption. Uh, and so I'll just show you some of a, a guide, a guardian, uh, let's make sure that the sound is on. But these are just some views that one can pick up off the internet of this uh, July 2019 paroxysmal eruption of Stromboli. Uh, the, the important thing about this is that, that um, and I wasn't able to show it, I would have liked to have shown it, but the, the webcam that I was sitting next to and that I pointed out to you from my slides that were taken up there, um, there is, there is a record of that. In fact, it's been posted by the INGV. And essentially, it's the, the last two minutes in the life of that webcam, because that was all the, the warning that was, was had by, that would have been had had any tourists be, been there. Essentially, what one sees on that webcam is one sees the, the, um, the Bunsen burner go off very strenuously. And then within a, a, about 15, 20 seconds after that, one sees the two little lava, glowing lava uh, craters begin to overflow. And then about a minute later, the whole summit area exploded. So anyone at, at the summit of that time would have had less than two minutes warning uh, about that. Um, there would have been no chance of escape. And um, um, there was fortunately only one fatality uh, on the afternoon of that. And, and it was an injury uh, of a tourist who was actually fatally injured by falling because he was in such a panic running away. That's it. Um, that's my final slide. This is the view again, the satellite view of the 2018 eruption, but that's it. Um, this is not Stromboli. This is actually a, a 2020 explosive eruption on Mount Etna. And uh, even now at the present time, Mount Etna is doing some quite interesting, uh, uh, very active Strombolian stuff. So um, that is it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Chris. Thanks very much for a fascinating presentation. So I have a question, if I might. Okay. Sure. Um, just looking at the structural side of the eastern side of Etna there, um, and with the swarm of faults that you have in that area, are there any comparisons to the um, St. Helens type structure um, and the Etna structure? And are there any sort of um, ideas that there could be a similar eruption on the eastern side of Etna? I, I, well, they, they are rather different. Etna is a, is a basaltic uh, magma, so it's uh, um, a, 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 whereas Mount St. Helens is more the, you don't, you're not likely to get the same explosive type of, or large scale explosive type of activity that one, one gets on, on Mount St. Helens. Mostly you get the, uh, the, the paroxysms, which is really gas escape from the basalt lava. And then, and then you get the big fissure eruptions, which send down these very fluid flows, like the one that overtook uh, Catania back in 1669, and and also the 2002-2003 eruption. So okay. it's, those, those are the ones that basically then resulted in those flows down the side that you could see. I think you said 92. Uh, 92 was yeah. it? Those, those. <coughs> so, uh, can I ask a question, please? So I would like to know that as much of this activity can be predicted with relative accuracy, does the Italian government have serious evacuation plans in place yes. in case one of these predictions actually comes true? Or do they regard it as so unlikely or so unpredictable that there's no point in having an actual plan yeah, uh, the, look, their, their, their monitoring is certainly fairly top class. So, you know, the, the, the volcano is in 
supplemented with seismometers, various kind of gas uh, measurements, geochemical stuff. Uh, and, and they publish a weekly bulletin, which I look at occasionally just to keep track of, of what's going on. So they, and, and, uh, and in particular, if there's any anomalous inflation of the, because you can pick that up on GPS, if there's any anomalous inflation, then, then they go into some kind of alerts. But I'm, I'm not too familiar with the actual, call it disaster management plans. Certainly on Stromboli, they had evacuated people uh, in, during previous eruptions and during the July eruption, uh, they were uh, getting most of the women and children off the island to Lipari with only, say, the, the, uh, the family heads, the males staying behind. So, yeah, so there are, I'm sure there are evacuation plans. In the case of um, Catania, well, it's, it's a fairly large city, and so it's not quite as easy to evacuate over there as for, for Stromboli. Thank you. Um, is John Forrest speaking. Uh, may I ask uh, Chris to tell him about a comical incident? Do you hear me? Yes, I can sir. hear you. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Mary and I, we were newly married and we traveled in southern Italy, Tormina. We stayed at Tormina and I was desperate to see Mount Etna. And we drove that day along the coast yeah. towards Mount Etna and it's a very uh, lots of tunnels and uh, yeah. you know a windy road all along the edge of the of the sea and uh, then we heard a, a, a siren going and Mary said that's it John Mount Etna is erupting you stop here <laughs> and uh, newly married an abiding husband I actually stopped there, but I was absolutely furious. I, mean, st I stopped and I actually walked out of the car for some distance just to cool down. And I never saw Mount Etna and we turned down and to this day never saw Mount Etna. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it turned, quite a nice trip. Turned out to be an ambulance going past. <laughs> yeah, 2017, I, we did a drive from Tarmina and then there's a quite a nice, there's a village called Zafarana and you go up to the cable station along the road, go, go winding up there. It's, uh, it's, it is quite a spectacular thing to do. Uh, uh. And Chris is picking up on, on Steve. Steve, are you still there? I mean, you, you, you presumably can add some more color to this presentation. So in our series on volcanics, um, we look forward to getting your views on it as well. And, and maybe you can also touch on the on the terroir and the wines that are grown in that region as well. We look Thank forward you, to that. Oh, sure. hmm? We look forward to that. Yeah. yeah. And next week we've got Mike. I see Mike. Mike's sitting looking at me. Welcome, Mike. Our next geologist. Lovely to have these lectures, John. Well done. Absolutely super. Uh, pleasure. Any more Any questions? More. Well, remember the same slot next week. It will be Mike. Okay, um, I look forward to that. Yeah. Yep. And that, uh, for the moment, brings our geologists to an end, but we're picking up again in a few weeks' time. Uh, thank you so much, and welcome to everybody who has uh, uh, joined us. Please, uh, we look forward to having, having you do so again. And thank you, Henny, for your hosting. Thank you, John, and thank you very much, Chris. Fascinating. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me.